It's now 9.37 a.m. and a quorum of the board is present. The State Board of Education meeting of October 22nd, 2020 is called to order. Due to the COVID-19 national emergency and in accordance with Public Act 228 of 2020, State Board of Education regular and committee of the whole meeting is being convened with remote access technology. First item on the agenda is the approval of agenda and order of priority. Are there any items uh, board members would like to add or delete from the agenda? Seeing none, may I please have a motion to approve the agenda and order of priority? So moved. I have a motion and I have a concurrent second. Um, any discussion? Your Honor, if we, you could do a roll call vote, please. Happy to do so. Fecto? Yes. McMillan? Yes. Critchett? Yes. Pugh? Yes. Ramos Montini is absent for the moment. She'll be joining shortly. Snyder? Tilly? Yes. Albrich? Yes. Motion carries. Thank you. You've just been hearing from Marilyn Schneider, our State Board Executive, to introduce the members of the State Board of Education. Marilyn, if you would, please. Hello. Yes, happy to do so. Um, the State Board of Education members are Dr. Cassandra Albrich. She's president from Dearborn. Dr. Pamela Pugh, Vice President from Saginaw, Ms. Michelle Fecto, Secretary from Detroit, Mr. Tom McMillan, Treasurer from Oakland Township, Ms. Tiffany Tully, NASB Delegate from Southfield, Ms. Lupe Ramos Montini, she's Chair of the SBE Legislative Committee, she's from Grand Rapids and she'll be with us shortly. Dr. Judy Pritchett, Co-Chair of the State Board of Education Legislative Committee and she's from Washington Township. Ms. Nikki Snyder is a SBE Legislative Committee member from Dexter. Ms. Brandy Johnson, the Governor's Policy Advisor for Education and Workforce. Um, I'm not sure, Brandy, are you on? She may be joining us later. And this year's Michigan Teacher of the Year for the school year 2020-21 is Mr. Owen Bondano. When he's not at the State Board of Education meeting, he's an English language arts teacher at Oak Park Freshman Institute in Oak Park Schools. Thank you. Thank you, Marilyn. Board members and members of the community, good morning again. <clears throat> Next item on our agenda will be COVID-19 related updates. I'll be sharing briefly on several areas related to the pandemic in the next 15 minutes or so. As is often the case, there's a lot of underlying detail um, associated with each of these issues. COVID-19 numbers. When I updated the board at our September 8th board meeting, we had just passed 27 million cases worldwide. Yesterday, we passed 41 million cases worldwide, an increase of 14 million cases, approximately a 50% increase in 44 days. By our September 8th board meeting, we had had 890,000 deaths worldwide. Yesterday, we had had more than 1.13 million deaths worldwide, an increase of 230,000 deaths worldwide, 27% in 44 days. When I updated the board at our September 8th board meeting, we had had 6.3 million cases nationally. By yesterday, we had had 8.3 million cases nationally, an increase of approximately 2 million cases, or roughly 32% in a 44-day period. By our September 8th meeting, we had had more than 189,000 deaths nationally. By yesterday, we'd had more than 222,000 deaths nationally, an increase of 33,000 deaths or 17% in a 44-day period. Some of you may have had the opportunity 
to watch Governor Whitmer and uh, Dr. Janae Caldoun yesterday. They had a press conference. They shared the most recent uh, numbers associated with Michigan, the coronavirus. They indicated that Michigan had experienced recent increases in new cases, deaths, positivity rates, and hospitalization rates in many regions across the state. The governor and Dr. Caldoun, our chief medical officer, expressed concern about these recent increases. And without belaboring them, certainly not a public health person, I'm not trying to suggest that I am, but the positivity rate across the state is up 4.9%. It is higher than that in a few of the regions, including my own uh, region, uh, substantially higher than that in the Upper Peninsula. The pandemic has adversely affected virtually all aspects of our country and much of the rest of the world as, um, as well. Food. Since our last board meeting, we received very good news from the United States Department of Agriculture, waivers to help us through the end of the school year. Board, as you know, in March, just after the governor closed schools, MDE applied successfully for a series of waivers with USDA to permit non-congregate feeding, that is feeding outside of schools and school cafeterias, meals for seven days a week rather than five, pickup of meals at the school or schools of any of the children in the family, rather than the requirement to pick up meals for each child at his or her school. And finally, free meals in all districts, not simply those with higher than 50% free or reduced price lunch eligibility. Board may also recall that the U.S. Secretary of Education inexplicably indicated in August that he didn't have authority to extend these waivers into this school year. Thanks to the advocacy of Senator Stabenow, our board president Ulbrich, department staff, and many organizations in Michigan and across the country, in late August, U.S. Secretary of Education, or Agriculture rather, walked back that reflection and extended the waivers through December 31st. A few weeks ago, he extended these waivers through the end of the school year. So the waivers that he didn't have the ability to extend at all, he extended first through December 31st, and then subsequently through the end of the school year. So pleased that he realized that the CARES Act gave him explicit authority to do so. Through yesterday, we had served more than 92.4 million meals during the pandemic in the last seven and a third months. Know though that um, across the country, meal provision, notwithstanding this additional flexibility from USDA, which is enormously appreciated, notwithstanding that uh, additional flexibility, meal provision across the country is down. The number of children to feed is not down, but the number of meals served is down during the pandemic. I want to thank Kyle Garant, Dr. Diane Golzinski, and the Office of Health and Nutrition Services for their important work in this area. Child care. We are launching our sixth round of child care grants during the pandemic. These grants are supported by congressionally approved coronavirus relief funds. They provide some child care subsidies for lower income families and some support for the child care providers themselves to help sustain the child care network, both in Michigan and across the country. And I want to thank Dr. Scott Kennigschneck, Lisa Brewer, Wall Raven, and the entire uh, child care team in the Office of Child Care for their important work in this area. In the absence of that work, many of our uh, families would not be able to uh, have their moms or dads, both their grandmas or grandpas, go to work. The child care permits them to be able to make that happen. Michigan Learning Channel. Michigan's public television stations, in partnership with education and community leaders, announced yesterday the creation of Michigan Le Learning Channel. Organized by Detroit Public Television, the network will deliver instructional content programming to students, parents, and teachers 
with a variety of media platforms, including a system of television channels. The Michigan Learning Channel is scheduled to begin operation in early January 2021 with language arts, math, science, and social studies instructional resources for students and teachers, beginning with pre-K to third grade content and quickly expanding to include grades four through 12. Sheila, and Al Sheila Alice and I have decided that we're going to have to tune in periodically to, uh, to get taught up. When fully developed, the uh, Michigan Learning Channel will include a statewide network of new broadcast channels dedicated to bringing this content into homes throughout Michigan to overcome limitations in online access for rural and urban areas. The Michigan Learning Channel concept has been endorsed by the Michigan Department of Education, uh, MASA, MAISA, and the business leaders for Michigan. Michigan Learning Channel will use its various platforms over the air, online, and through social media to increase access to educational programming and resources. This is an especially critical need during the pandemic. The instructional content um, on Michigan Learning Channel will be aligned with Michigan's educational standards and will follow widely accepted sequencing for mastering skills throughout the school year to make it as useful as possible for schools and students and by extension for parents as well. Designed to support and enrich school learning, the lessons will be presented by a diverse group of teachers delivered as if the teachers were in classroom settings, just as if they were our very own Tiffany Tilly today. The broadcast channel will deliver lessons in scheduled 30 and 60 minute blocks for each grade level throughout the day, which will be repeated during the evenings and weekends. All content will be free. Content does not replace teachers. It's not meant to, but it does give families and educators a lot more options to support students and student success during the current crisis and beyond. In this way, we can help engage parents more deeply in their children's learning. We can also encourage them to form strong partnerships with teachers and their local schools as relevant. Funding for Michigan Learning Channel is from awards totaling $3.5 million, $1.5 million through a grant supported by the Governor's Education Emergency Relief Fund, which was part of the CARES Act, and the remainder through funding from the Michigan State Legislature. I want to uh, acknowledge and appreciate uh, the governor and the legislature's support of this very, very important work. We're cobbling it together in the pandemic. Uh, there are an awful lot of things that we're working to, um, to address in the pandemic, and this will be an important resource for us um, in the coming uh, weeks and uh, months of the pandemic. And I want to especially thank uh, Chief Deputy Superintendent Sheila Alice, her Chief of Staff Mark Howe for their work in um, making Michigan Learning Channel a reality. ESSER formula grants. Uh, the board uh, may recall that Congress has passed four major coronavirus relief acts um, during the pandemic. The largest of the four, which I just mentioned, the CARES Act, provides $13.2 billion nationally from the Elementary and Secondary School Emergency Relief Fund for pre-K-12 education to state education agencies. SEAs, state education agencies, then have the responsibility of distributing at least 90% of the ESSER funds in formula grants based on the Title I Part A funding formula. MDE's deadline for receipt of local education agencies' applications for these formula grants was September 30th. All LEAs in the state uh, eligible for these grants, uh, but three submitted applications that have been approved. In total, more than $350 million were allocated and approved by formula. 
ESSER competitive grants. As the board is also aware from previous discussions, with most of the remainder of the CARES Act funding, ESSER fund dollars, MDE set up an education equity fund. Kyle Garant, our Deputy Superintendent for Finance and Operations, and I will share a few slides regarding the grant competition and the winners uh, thereof. So as I mentioned, there's the 90% by formula right up front. That's the $350 million and change, uh, all by Title I Part A formula. We've talked about these funds uh, and talked about these funds and talked about these funds board. They are now uh, fully um, applied for and with the exception of the three school districts that declined to apply. And yes, we reached out to them very specifically to make sure that they did not want these funds. Um, uh, all have applied for, all have received approval for the formula grants. The equity fund was created out of remaining ESSER funds. And if we could uh, move to the next slide, we'll talk a little bit about uh, the purpose of these funds. The board may recall that districts could apply for the purposes of narrowing the digital divide, number one, and providing mental health services and supports for uh, children and for the adults that serve children in schools. This is a competitive grant program, unlike the 90%, which is distributed by formula. This is a competitive grant program that focuses largely on districts meeting at least one of the following needs-based criteria. The district is over 85% economically disadvantaged as measured by free or reduced price lunch eligibility. At least one school in the district is over 85% economically disadvantaged. The district is over 20% students with disabilities or the district is over 10% English learners. So here are our recipients, broadly writ. 569 applicants for these uh, dollars. 569 applicants applied for $63.4 million. That is to say they, they had explicit requests of $63.4 million. 328 of those LEAs were funded for a total of 37 point four million dollars. 280 of the highest need districts were awarded thirty five point three million dollars, roughly ninety four point three percent of the funds available. In addition, 48 high needs districts were awarded two point one million dollars. 5.7% uh, of the funds available. If I could just stop there for one second and uh, provide a little bit of texture. The 280 represent districts that met at least one of the four criteria that I just noted. 85% free or reduced price lunch eligibility as a district, 85% free or reduced price lunch eligibility in at least one school, 20% or more special needs students, 10% or more English language learners. The other 48 demonstrated a high need of one sort or another. We were cognizant um, in uh, fleshing this out. Uh, we heard from local school districts that said, hey, we may not be 85% free or reduced price lunch eligible, but we might be 75%. Give us a crack at this, and we did. We thought there was some logic to that, and so we opened it up wider, recognizing that the priority was districts with uh, profound need, but if you could demonstrate um, uh, somewhat lesser need, but still significant need, both um, with respect to any of those four categories and with and or, and rather, with respect to either the digital divide or um, mental health challenges, um, we would consider you for funding, and we did. Let's go to the next slide. A 
Kyle, can we move to the next slide? Yeah, I'm sorry, Dr. Rice, it kind of froze up on me here. Okay, all right, well, I'll, I'll just keep, right here. That, that's all good. It, um, there you go, sorry about that. Okay, um, as with any competitive uh, process, um, there are uh, there are those that are successful, there are others that aren't. There were 241 unfunded applicants. Um, their applications totaled uh, approximately $11 million. Some of the applications that we funded um, were funded, many of them were funded completely, uh, but some were funded in, uh, in part. So there was a mix, the fully funded, the partially funded, and uh, many that you can see here were, were not funded. And so let's look at the um, let's look at the mix of the use of funds um, for the successful grant applications. Of the 328 grants that were approved, 7.6 million of them were to provide mental health services and support. 29.7 million to narrow the digital divide. So about a four to one ratio digital divide to mental health services and support. These are both enormously important. They've each become more important in the midst of the pandemic. And uh, we got very, very good feedback from our schools, our school districts, um, from this uh, from this process, and I know that there are going to be a lot of school districts that are very excited um, when they find out uh, today that they um, that they have been successful in their grant applications. And that is um, that's really it on the uh, on the educational equity piece. I would like to um, uh, share on one more um, issue if I could. And I would be remiss if I didn't say a few words uh, in my estimation about count day or count month uh, and a special concern that I have this year about our children. As the board may be aware, count day for enrollment this year was October 7th. That said, counting is quite a bit different this year for many districts, both for attendance purposes and enrollment purposes. While districts have a choice about how they count for enrollment purposes, many of them will be counting so-called two-way interactions with children over a four-week period of time. Across the state, across the country, many educators have been concerned about children that aren't showing up in any counts in any schools. This would be an alarming phenomenon any year, but it is particularly alarming in a pandemic when many children are not attending school in person. We've begun discussion with education organization leaders in the state. Uh, I have written local and intermediate school superintendents as well as public school academy directors about this issue. And I've advocated two things with them. First, uh, to please take every possible measure to connect with every family whose children you served last year if you haven't done so already. Please don't assume that a child or children aren't in your district this year because they are being educated in another district or public school academy, in a private or parochial school, or at home. This may or may not be so. In most cases, parents will have made other legitimate decisions for their children's education, including homeschooling, and that's fine. What's unacceptable, however, is the specter of some children not being educated at all. With calls, texts, letters, home visits, and connections through boys and girls clubs, neighborhood associations, faith-based institutions, and other individuals and institutions within communities, we need to make every effort possible to figure out where our children served last year in each community are this year and where they are being educated. Children shouldn't go missing from school. Second, we should encourage the registration of homeschooled children 
by those parents who choose to homeschool their children. As Deputy Superintendent for Finance and Operations Kyle Garant recently wrote, it is not required by law to register a child for homeschooling. That said, registration benefits the homeschooling family. It maintains connections with the local school district for auxiliary services, records requests, and possible re-enrollment. Moreover, it establishes the homeschooling in a formal way in case a law enforcement official raises the issue of truancy with the family. As importantly, the ability of school districts in the state to count homeschool students and the ability to count public, private, and parochial school students combine to mean that we are able to estimate the number of students who aren't being educated at all at the moment with the assumption that the numbers of students leaving and entering the state this school year are roughly the same. This ability to ensure that all students are safe and educated is vital, especially in a pandemic. President Albrecht, members of the board, members of the community, there is so much more to share about extended COVID-19 learning plans, about the monthly process of review, about physical education, about literacy, about social and emotional learning, about our mitigation efforts. I look forward to additional sharing in the coming months, and I'd be happy to answer any questions that you may have at this time. Questions or comments uh, from board members? Yeah, I do. Uh, Mr. McMillan. Yeah, I, uh, I'd like to know what MEDC or MDC is MDE is doing um, to just reduce the trauma on on kids. I mean, you know, during this uh, COVID crisis, you know, I think it's important to look at relative risk. Um, you know, the the risk according to the CDC of a person dying of an unintentional fall, a car accident, or unintentional poisoning is about one in twenty five hundred. Um, the CDC also says that um, from 0 to two, 24, people 0 to 24, their risk uh, is 1 in 200,000 of dying of COVID. So it's about 80 times uh, less likely than dying in a car accident or from a fall or poisoning. So, I, you know, I think that that's the relative risk. And yet we're putting these kids through so much trauma that I just uh, I don't understand, uh, you know, why why this is being done the way it is. I, you know, some say, well, they may go home and infect grandma. Well, I'm a grandpa. I have three grandkids, and I would hope there's very few grandparents who would want their grandkids to go through what these kids are going through uh, under the assumption that I can't take care of myself or that we can't uh, do as the uh, Barrington Declaration says, focus protection. Um, so, I mean, there's, you know, even uh, even those getting um, it, it's a lot. It's about as likely those that uh, if in order of uh, dying of COVID um, for all the population is about as likely as that uh, unintentional fall, but dying of car accident or uh, unintentional poisoning. So, you know, I just uh, I I really think that uh, this is it's a shame what's going on. Um, and I just wonder what we are doing, what MDE is doing to kind of try to reduce that. I understand there are some teachers that are refusing to come back to school and, and do in person. And, you know, maybe if they have comorbidities or something, maybe they can be the ones that are staying home. I'm not saying that we should be making those decisions, but what can we do to be encouraging districts to help kids reduce this trauma that's being inflicted upon them by people who, um, well, currently it's being inflicted upon by a health direct, a department health director who has as much health experience as I do or my 11 year old does. So um, I just, you know, I wonder what MDE is doing. When you say, what is M MDE doing? What, what is you, MDE how doing? How are you advising to... or what are you doing to help districts reduce the trauma on students during this time that's being inflicted upon them unnecessarily. Right. So we have um, we have worked with districts to um, to encourage uh, trauma informed care 
and professional development in trauma-informed care. We are working on um, the establishment of social and emotional learning uh, networking in the state. Um, we have partnered with Michigan Virtual on um, uh, trauma-informed care uh, professional development modules for, um, for teachers. There's an enormous amount of stress now, both for people who are in school and for people who are not in school. Um, when you talk with teachers, um, and we're going to hear from two of our teachers later today, our Michigan Teacher of the Year, our Region 2 Teacher of the Year, uh, they will tell you under what stress our teachers are. And um, my, what I have found is teachers are stressed, uh, whether they are at school or whether they are at a distance. It's a tremendously difficult moment for, for them, for our students, uh, for, our, for our parents. And I don't think, um, I am supportive of a wide range of choices for children, particularly for children who are educationally vulnerable. Um, our uh, particular high needs, special education youngsters, our beginning English language learners, our fledgling readers and the like. But I'm not in favor of compelling people against their will to go into a school space that they feel is unsafe. And so I think it's important that parents have choices for their children, that they are able to access those choices. And if they feel that their child should stay home in a pandemic, either because of the, the health of the child or the health of somebody else in the family, that should be available to them. But by, extent, by extension, I think that there ought to be in-person opportunities as well, until, unless and until we move back to a phase three um, existence. And that's a, different, that's a different time and a different conversation. But I do think those choices um, are important. We have encouraged those choices, particularly with small groups um, in the largest of our schools. What I can tell you is that many districts in the state, and I've spoken with many of their leaders, many of the districts in the state are small. They are rural and they are in person um, in large measure. They don't get the same attention that larger districts get. But you may recall at the beginning of the year, we noted that 86% of the districts in the state were offering some form of in-person instruction. Now, that didn't mean 86% of our children were going to school in person. They most assuredly were not. I believe had we been able to track that number precisely on any given day, it would have been less than 50%. But my point is that the choice, Mr. McMillan, was available. And I think that the choice is important. Uh -huh. This is not that this is not a choice mantra pre pandemic. This is a choice um, perspective during the, the pandemic. But I do think it's important that parents have opportunities to choose what's best for their their children. And I believe that it's important for staff members in many regards to do so as well. But you know as well as I do that how that plays out in the state state of Michigan with its local control uh, structure is is overwhelmingly about local decisions negotiated at the local school district level. We could argue whether that's good or bad, either pre-pandemic or during a pandemic, but I don't think we can argue that it doesn't exist. It most assuredly does. Yeah. Um, other questions? Or, did, did I do justice to that um, question or not? Yeah, well, it, I mean, I um, I think that we could be doing more, particularly, um, you know, making sure that there's a is there a good there's a good interchange of information from districts from district to district. I know they do that on their own, but we can encourage, um, you know, what uh, how do you how do you help get teachers who are refusing to come in? And I know many are not; they're not refusing, but I mean there are. I'm hearing more and more. There's just a lot of them that uh, could come in, 
but they won't. And so, um, you know, just maybe that, you know, trying to strategies to make sure they're the ones maybe doing the, uh, the, you know, instruction uh, via the internet and then the ones that do want to come in, make sure that they're coming in and maybe get additional ones if needed, uh, you know, temp substitute. I mean, Somewhere. can we help figure that out? So I just, yeah. uh, let me just say, let me just say that's going on right now. It's going on every day in 832 LEAs across the state. Mm -hmm. And in some cases it's with our guidance, but in most cases, it is playing out at the local district level in negotiations between labor and management because that's the structure in our state. And, and again, you don't have to agree with the structure, but the structure doesn't change as a function of a pandemic. Um, it, is, it is a state where you negotiate the, the terms and conditions of employment. Um, and that doesn't cease to exist in, in the midst of a pandemic. Um, other questions or comments? Questions or comments? I have this, completely... Uh, okay, this is Cassandra. I was next. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Uh, and I had a question, but before I get to that, I, I just want to say how much I appreciate the fact that we are having a conversation about social emotional um, uh, aspects of everything that's going on as well. Um, so that's great. Um, just a, a reiteration of, of the, the idea that um, dying from COVID is not the only concern that we have. Um, a lot of people get sick and have very long term ramifications from that. So I think that that needs to play into our considerations as well. And I did have a very interesting conversation with a doctor this week who um, kind of opened my eyes a little bit. Uh, this is someone who is in a practice and basically said their office does not, if you have a respiratory illness at this point, you can't go to their office. They're not going to see you. It doesn't matter how long you've been one of their patients. You're going to get pushed to urgent care or emergency care, and that's the last thing you want. Um, so there's more aspects to this than just is someone going to die from COVID. There's the illness, and then there's also the impact on the healthcare system in general as well. So, but all all important points to remember, as well as the social emotional aspects for kids. My question uh, was about the homeschool registry that you talked about. I know in Michigan it's not a requirement that anyone register uh, their children if they're homeschooling, but uh, I don't think people realize that there is a an optional um, way to do this. So can you talk a little bit more about what that mechanism is in the state of Michigan? Yeah, and you know what? I'm going to defer to our deputy superintendent uh, for finance and operations, Kyle Garant, um, in whose uh, division, uh, this function takes place. Mr. Garant. So yes, thank you, Dr. Rice. So, um, you know, districts or families that are considering homeschooling, um, there is an optional um, uh, registration process that we um, help facilitate um, and that um, not only people that are that people are providing homeschool services, whether it's a parent that's just homeschooling their own child or if it's a parent um, homeschooling multiple children that they can register uh, with us with the state and and uh, we know who they are um, and who's providing those services um, and, and how many students they are are serving. Uh, we don't know uh, because of the kind of the sample size in those instances it's you know usually one or two students we don't have any student information um, specifically because it's such a small population we're not trying to you know compromise um, personally protected information, but we know who the who the providers are of that education. But as Dr. Rice mentioned, and you mentioned Cassandra, there's there's not a requirement to do so. Um, Dr. Rice mentioned in his comments that those that um, do that have students that want to um, access um, auxiliary services, um, you know, that's that's the mechanism that they can use to to be um, kind of still plugged in with the public school to receive or have access to those auxiliary services. And I think you know just to um, thank you, Mr. Garan, just to just to reflect additionally um, on that. Uh, under normal circumstances, um, this would not be, uh, I believe, a topic of conversation. 
Um, but in the midst of a pandemic, with districts not simply in the state but across the country expressing concern about children showing up for precisely no form of education. I think we have to be concerned about where our children are in the midst of a pandemic. And I think we have to reflect upon the mechanisms that we use um, in the midst of a pandemic, which may be different from those that we used uh, pre-pandemic. They don't necessarily have to endure post-pandemic, but they certainly should be reflected upon and addressed during the during the pandemic. Uh, President Albrecht, do you have anything more? Uh, no, okay, no. very good. Uh, Dr. Pugh. So, yeah, and I too, I wanna <clears throat> just reiterate um, my thanks and appreciation to the department for um, going above and beyond and making sure that the staff and the department, uh, as well as the board, um, are following the guidelines of Department of Health and Human Services to keep public health out front. And I too just wanted to raise the issue of um, the impacts of COVID. So dying, yes, uh, we don't want to see anyone die, but we're learning more and more about this disease uh, with adults, we're seeing what is called long haul. I think that's what you were referring to, Cassandra. We've also learned when we first thought that this was a respiratory disease that it, it impacts every system in the body. We've seen it impact every system. And I just want to talk about um, some of the folks that that I've seen. There was a teacher in the state uh, that, that passed away recently from COVID. I posted it on my page and immediately a childhood friend, a uh, childhood classmate posted and said, I know her daughter uh, and uh, it's devastating for us. A friend of mine that I went to college with, I gave to a family because they had lost their child. Uh, I think the child was, I don't even know if she was 13, who died of COVID. I was um, speaking to a complete stranger over the phone who lives in the thumb area where there's not a lot of cases, but there was one child who contracted the illness and has an inflammatory uh, symptom. So that means that it, they had to leave the area and flown or sent to University of Michigan Hospital and had been hospitalized uh, for a month at that time. Um, and that means that, that it's impacted that child's multiple systems uh, in that child's body. So um, it's not just the, the that, that's the data uh, we're looking at, at as well, um, in addition to the numbers and the fact that each of, each of these children and adults that I've talked about have family members who are left behind. Um, so, uh, just wanted to, to mention that uh, as well. And let me just say one other thing, uh, Cassandra, to your point about the other uh, imminent services that are needed within our hospital system. I have a friend who uh, has stage four cancer, breast cancer. Before COVID hit, they had a while before they found it. When COVID hit, they found a lump. It had grown um, massively uh, by the time that, that she was able to get back into the hospital or get back into the, the doctor's office to get that, that follow-up check. So these are very real data points, uh, uh, and these are real people. Thank you, Dr. Pugh. Welcome to uh, board member Lupe ramos Montini, who has uh, joined us. Uh, Ms. Snyder, question and a comment. You need to um, unmute. unmute. There we go. There you go. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Uh, a couple comments, a couple questions. Um, first, I'd like to say that I very much agree with you that it is unacceptable for a child to go without education. I shared that strong passion uh, at our last board meeting as I wanted to talk about the educational gap that I feel like is growing. It's significant. It's very important, very concerning. Um, when this is our focus, the MDE and our board will naturally focus its discussion on extending resources and assisting parents. 
who are feeling unsafe, I think, in returning to school due to COVID. So if our discussion is straying from, from that, it, our focus isn't, isn't on those things, I would say. Um, but to take a sidestep from there and talk about trauma, I do have a question um, before I proceed with other comments and questions. So we talk about trauma informed. What does that mean? Um, that means we we kind of sit and we listen and we learn about what trauma is, uh, what people who've been through trauma um, go through, the experience of trauma, how it impacts all walks of life, our every day. So so being trauma informed. That's like the first step. It's a very, very important first step. But what is the change in practice in the way that we relate to one another after being trauma informed? Um, oftentimes, I feel like when we have this discussion, I do not hear uh, anything that relates to what is the change in practice. Um, so that would be my question. Uh, what is the change in practice? And I understand that during a pandemic, that's a difficult thing to define or to discuss in, in depth. And sometimes it's more um, hindsight than it is foresight or current insight. So um, my question is, OK, so what are we doing as far as a change in practice? Um, otherwise, we're just sort of talking about something and not doing anything about something. Right. Well, we can uh, we can certainly have someone share in greater detail the value of ACEs training, adverse childhood experiences training. It's not simply informing people about trauma, it's also sharing with them how to work with young people in trauma. I'm reminded of the large number of young people who used to walk into our schools, um, really um, pretty, pretty torn up by what they had experienced in their homes um, the, the preceding day, night, weekend, um, and it took time to dial them down, reground them, um, get them ready to um, to work. That's all part of trauma informed care professional development. It's not simply recognizing trauma and the toxicity uh, around trauma, but it's also saying how do you work with young people who have uh, been subject to or continue to be subject to trauma, how do you avoid pushing their buttons? How do you give them safe spaces to feel comfortable rooting and um, beginning to grow in a school space? One of my concerns at the moment is for so many of our young people, home and school are the same. So they don't get to leave home to find another space for the, for the day. And for a lot of our kids, leaving home for those several hours, finding adults with whom uh, they are comfortable, who are pouring into them, who care about them, who understand them, who have some measure of understanding, not complete perhaps, but some measure of understanding of the trauma that, that they are uh, going through, that they are living, um, that that is settling for them. And they can then cast off a little bit of whatever they are struggling with at a given moment and spend some time focusing on themselves, focusing on not so much their trauma, but focusing on their self-actualization. They, they, in a fashion, get outside of themselves. But that's only done with trained adults who have a sense that when Michael comes into a school with a face that says, back off, don't get near me, that face isn't meant to be, it, I mean, it may be meant to be repellent at a given moment, but you, you ought not to walk away from that child as a result of that. You ought to reflect upon what that child is experiencing, give him a safe sp space in your school and an opportunity to ground and then by extension have several good hours in, in school. So trauma-informed care goes far beyond simply informing people the toxicity of trauma to, okay, now what? How do you work with young people in particular um, situation or situations? A number of us believe that teachers are made or broken, strength of teachers teaching made or broken based on those relationships and your ability to understand what your young people are experiencing, at least in small measure, when they walk into your schools. 
We'd be happy to share more in this area. We, we are actively working in the social and emotional learning space. We're one of eight states in the country that has a, um, that has a grant with the Council of Chief State School Officers and CASEL, which is the premier social and emotional learning um, association in the country, number one. We have pulled together a group of educators from across the state that is growing around this issue of social and emotional learning. This has a lot of tentacles, has a lot of involvement. We'd be happy to share more with the board in the coming months. Oh, well, a couple more things. Yeah. Um, I guess I sort of heard and am picking out from, from that back and forth here just now. Uh, separation of home and school for for kids that maybe need to go to school and and socially emotionally that's healthy for them um, but then there's also the reverse so I heard you say you're not compelled to force parents to send their children into a space they don't feel safe right um, due to COVID but we want to be careful about being willing to force the concept that you define safe by requiring registration for homeschool parents um, I'm definitely going to be interested in the discussion. I really caution our board and our education um, systems. It's dangerously abusive to begin a conversation with the assumption that our definition of safe is to be upheld or that we assume that only professional adults can best provide care for a trauma, a child that's been through trauma. So um, sometimes the best environment and, and oftentimes in certain situations is not to be in school necessarily. Or there's various reasons why parents are the best educator for their child. Um, so the same way that we're honoring teachers and parents who feel unsafe due to COVID, we need to honor um, the options that our educational landscape provides because that's what really gives us the choice that you kept referring to, the choice um, to make for each individual child that's best for them. So um, as we wade into that discussion, uh, that's going to be something that really needs to be thought well through um, and consistent. If we're if we're delivering the message that you're delivering this morning, then that really does transfer to the discussion of what's ahead. Um, and then I have a question that's sort of attached to that. What are the numbers that we hold on the level of disengagement related to COVID? And I have to believe we have some data from the past, and at some point we will have collected, maybe through count, the data of who has disengaged. And like you said, we haven't heard at all from them. So what is that data? How do you define disengagement? It, like you said, you haven't heard from them. You don't like what you said in the beginning. Maybe students that you have not heard from, you we, haven't made contact with. We do not have collective. We do not have collective data on this in the state. And part of the point that I made um, in the last um, section of my presentation was, in the absence of counting homeschooled children, we are not able to count that last bucket of children. In order to in order to make to have some sense of what the number of children uh, is that is associated with no form of education in the state. You have to be able to count homeschool children. There are public school children, there are private, there are parochial, there are homeschool. If you can count all four, then you have a relative sense of who is not being educated. But in the absence of counting that fourth category, you can't know the fifth category. So I share your interest in knowing those numbers, it was in that spirit that I raised the issue. So, so I just want to follow up on on the assumption that we cannot derive that number. So, the, not to be rude, but to be very direct, um, there is a number of students that we had enrolled in school last before COVID hit, and then there's a number of students that we are now we have not enrolled or that will not show up for count day and that's a basic subtraction i have to assume and if if that's a, the wrong assumption then that's fine um but the other thing i i concern about it if we if we aren't looking for that number without having to register homeschool parents uh then how are we getting numbers of meals served uh, aren't down, but number in need or so like we've got numbers that we can certainly make a solid estimation 
of the disengagement related to COVID without assuming or asserting or insisting on home school parents registering. That's, I think that's possible. Well, I mean, without uh, going too far down the rabbit hole, the counting of meals and the counting of children are not the same, um, number one. Number two, um, we don't distribute meals um, based on uh, the same level of specificity or in the same process that we count children, number two. Three, we can count public school children. We're doing that now. We're in the midst of count day or count month, if you will. Um, similarly, there are counts being taken um, at private and parochial schools as well. The concern is when you finish all of those counts, you have a group of children who are unaccounted for. Are they being homeschooled? Are they not being schooled at all? To what extent is it in the one group or is it in the other group? My point is we need to understand, look, if all of those children are being homeschooled, that's fine. That's very different from not being schooled at all. I place no value judgment on um, a parent or parents that want to homeschool, that's fine. That's a legitimate choice for a parent. Um, but the question becomes, how many of our children are in none of those four um, opportunities? Public schools, private schools, parochial schools, home schools. How many of our young people are in none of those? And how can we make sure that we, um, that every child has a place where he or she is educated um, during this time. Uh, Ms. Fecto and then Ms. Tilly. Okay, thank you. Um, so my concern as a parent and as a wife and mother and daughter of teachers um, is, so, uh, you know, I think people should have choice, but I also think, um, uh, there should be based on science and facts, and um, and people should have that information. Um, and I, I, so a couple of things. Um, right now, we don't know what the levels of COVID infection will be if we open up all the schools more broadly. We we know that if we have gatherings indoors, especially if there's not good ventilation systems and if um, the distancing and the masks are not adhered to, that we know that those types of gatherings lead to spreading of a very infectious virus, which is very not like driving a car. It's not like uh, getting an accident. It's, it's an infection that spreads incredibly quickly. And so um, I think the comparison to other types of um, uh, uh, of accidents is is like apples to oranges because it's it's so so unique in in uh, a disease. So we don't really know what would happen except that science tells us when we put these this combination together, it's it's gonna it's gonna increase the risk of spread. So I think teachers are are wise to be hesitant to go into something that science and scientists and CDC and you know everybody else is telling us that this is a, this is a high risk. So um, in, in so so the levels have been low so far. Well, the, the students have been um, uh, greatly isolated, and and I think that's why the levels have been so um, have been more positive. I also. Um, I'm curious to see what, you know, because I've heard sort of anecdotally and read in different places that the number of retirements of teachers have gone up, people leaving the profession have gone up, women in particular are leaving work um, uh, because of this. And so we are also looking at the need to retain um, good teachers and, um, and we have to balance all these things. The other thing is I wanted to say some some parents really don't have a choice um, and they're the people that are getting sickest the most. Those are the service workers, some of the low income workers um, or, uh, you know, health professionals that um, are 
you know, called into um, to work and, and coming back. And th so the numbers around African Americans and Hispanic also have, is connected to their work that they do and, and um, how many people are in their home. Um, and these people, if they want to eat and live, <laughs> they have a really hard choice between, you know, um, they have to work. And so they need someone to watch their kids. And so um, it's not a, it's, it's not really a choice for them. It's, it's just survival. Um, but it's, I, I think these folks need more support. I'd also like to sorry, make mention of trauma. So my, my 13 year old great niece was diagnosed with COVID. She lives just a couple of blocks away from me. And that was, if you want to talk about trauma, it wasn't just trauma for her. It was trauma for her brothers. It was trauma for her parents. It was trauma for me. It was trauma for everybody to have her, this little girl, um, be receive this positive, have to be isolated. Everybody's on edge. Everyone's worried. It's 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 a it, it, and to to go to school, have your classmate that's you're in your room be diagnosed with COVID, and then you come home, and then all those families are traumatized by that. Um, I think that that's it's there's levels of trauma, and I think the the, the level of dealing with the the you know what the outcome of that's going to be, who's going to be affected, and if that little girl feels responsible for making her family sick, and it's so yeah, it's it's hard being staying at home and going. I, I've got a 12 year old who I can't keep off of Roblox. And uh, every time I turn around, he's not doing his schoolwork. He's on roadblocks. Um, and, you know, I've got a 17 year old here, a senior in high school, who's, you know, missing all of the things that she had worked so hard and looked forward to. And that's really hard. But I guess I just come down to I don't think it's worth risking her life for. I don't think it's a risk worth risking her health for. I don't think it's worth risking the, our families. Um, I just, it's, I wish it wasn't here. I wish I didn't have to make that choice. But um, to me, I just, you know, with the, with the numbers going up right now, oh, two days in a row, over 2,000, our death rates going up again, our hospitals are getting crowded again, and now we want to open up schools and increase the numbers of, of you know, of, of COVID infections when we're about ready to hit the winter season and everyone's saying we're, we're headed for the second peak and it's going to be higher. We have excess deaths in this country of 300,000 because during this period from January to now, um, all, you know, somehow, maybe not directly related to COVID, but um, 200,000 of them are directly related, really, that's real, directly related to COVID, 220,000. I, I just don't see how that can be ignored. Um, so my question after <laughs> my speech is, um, uh, how many do we know how many teachers have left the profession or retired um, over this last year or so? So we've been doing some work with our education organizations, uh, middle cities, MASA, MASB, um, MASSP, MAISA, MEMSPA, uh, MEA, AFT Michigan. Um, our retirements are not up this year over okay. last year. So there was not an out migration, uh, a, a greater out migration from the profession than um, than we would have expected based on the last four years of data. Okay. That's with respect to teachers. With respect to support staff, it's a little bit different. With respect to support staff, um, our retirements are up in the MIPSER system. We are trying to get a better handle on precisely what this means. Um, as you are well aware, the analysis of teacher data and the analysis of support staff data are very different. Teacher data is much simpler to analyze than is support staff data. It's much simpler because the vast majority of teachers are in the MIPSERS retirement system. The same is not true for the vast majority of support staff members. So when you have support staff data um, that you are analyzing in MIPSERS, you are analyzing but a fraction 
of the data on support staff members, whereas when you are analyzing teacher data in MIPSERS, in the in the MIPSERS retirement system, you are analyzing the vast majority of teacher data. We are trying to peel back support staff data to understand within which subfields of support staff this is particularly an issue. Trying to look at not just MIPSERS data, but non-MIPSERS data, non-MIPSERS retirements. Mm -hmm. uh, but what I can tell you is in aggregate, in the MIPSER system, there is an increase in, uh, there was an increase this past year in retirements of support staff members broadly writ. But over the, so, and, and over the next month, we're gonna be peeling that back, looking at non-MIPSERS retirements, number one, breaking it out by type of support staff member, number two, so we can see, is this more acute in particular areas than in others among support staff members? Or is this a phenomenon broadly writ um, across uh, support staff members? One wonders if this is the, the same exodus if you are um, pensioned versus if you are not pensioned. One running hypothesis that a number of us have is, is that you might be more likely to retire if you are in the MIPSER system than if you are not and that um, that your your average retirement age would be a little bit um, younger mm -hmm. if you are in the MIPSER system than if you are not in the MIPSER system. But but I mean, to your question, uh, Ms. Vecto, those are those are all running hypotheses and we're peeling back that data now. Leah Breen, our head of the Officer of Educator, Office of Educator Excellence, is working with me with others on this uh, on this work. Thank you. Yeah, you bet. Uh, Ms. Tilly. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Um, I, I just want to remind everybody to be mindful <laughs> and to be sensitive. This is a very um, hard conversation, very painful for a lot of people, even if it's not painful for you. Um, and yes, people are in fear and they should be teachers, parents. Um, you know, they say politics is local. And so I think too, with, with this disease, it's affected different um, communities differently as well. And it's local, it's a local situation. Some, some communities have been hit harder than others. I know in Detroit, they did um, a collage back in August of 900 people that were um, victims of the coronavirus that had died. And they set their pictures out on Belle Isle so that people could actually mourn because people couldn't even have funerals for their family members. And um, that was 900 pictures in August, but way more than that have died. I was one of those people that lost a family member. My sister-in-law died um, and we could not have a funeral for my sister-in-law. I could not hug my nieces, my nephew. I could not hug my children um, because we were in the beginning of the pandemic and, and we just did not know. Um, everybody was afraid. My son was afraid to hug me because I have asthma and bronchitis and he didn't want to get me sick. But um, at one point, I lost people in my circle every single day. So you, we want to talk about trauma. There are other people that are having these experiences. And some of those people were well pu publicized. Um, Isaac Robinson, State Rep Isaac Robinson, um, former state senator um, Morris Hood, um, a lot of people, and we're, so we're not even talking about people that don't have insurance. We're, we're talking about people that have insurance that are upwardly mobile that have lost their lives because of this. Um, so I, I want to make sure that we are not judging teachers or parents for being afraid to go to a, a, a physical building. Um, 
right now the, the numbers are soaring in Michigan. It's not talked about as much, it seems, as in the beginning of the pandemic. But on October 19th, there were 4,718 cases in Michigan. So we need to like look at all of the data and be concerned about the whole picture, not just parts of it. And I think it's very important to not judge communities, not judge judge um, people that are going through what they are going through because of the pandemic, but to, to let communities uh, deal with this issue on their own without us sitting here judging them for, for what's happening. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Tilly. Um, other, other board members, other reflections, questions, comments? That was a pretty heavy um, opening topic. I almost feel like we need, uh, we need a break. Oh, I, uh, well, I thought Pam had a comment. I'm sorry, I beg your pardon. Um, Dr. Pugh. Yeah, I, one of the things that I did not want to let slip by, um, and Tom, you were so kind to, to recognize me, but you, you commented about the trauma inflicted by Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. And as a public health uh, person, professional, uh, I definitely am uh, happy in the direction that Michigan Department of Health has gone as far as protecting the health and well-being of children of teachers, of the general public. And as it relates to trauma, I am definitely, like others have said, so happy that we're having this conversation because we've had this conversation uh, prior to, to, to COVID. During COVID, the term social and emotional learning struck a chord and we had to remove it when we had the conversation about uh, code of conduct because it was not a topic uh, that was appeasing to everyone on the board. So when we talk about social and emotional supports, when we talk about our mental health infrastructure, um, these are when we talk about the school infrastructure, uh, these are issues that we've talked about uh, for many years. Um, and now that we're in this time of COVID, when we need all of those supports, uh, and we all can talk about trauma, we can talk about buildings being safe. But these are things that we've talked about for, for many years, and now it's the chickens coming home to roost because now we have uh, buildings that have been underfunded, school systems that have been underfunded, mental health uh, uh, infrastructure that has been uh, abolished. We have social emotional learning and, and trauma informed care that just we don't, we have turned our head or put our head in the sand to. Uh, but as a public health professional, Michigan Department of Health and Human Services, uh, other public health professionals, these are things that we've long talked about, thought about, and definitely have thought about uh, as this uh, disease that was coming up and now. I do want to also speak to next month, we will talk about impacts at home. And that's a, a, a project that we started, an initiative that we started with a lot of partners with, their, with different backgrounds. We're talking about how can we get children moving. We started this in May uh, because we knew that, that we needed to get our children moving for their physical health, but also as a social and emotional uh, uh, support uh, to them. Um, and then we also, I just want to also just talk about the school environment um, and for many schools, because this is just not something that they have the wherewithal, for lack of a better word, to be thinking about when they're thinking about everything else. But it has definitely been uh, an afterthought, and I'm happy that next month we will be uh, talking more about that. And I did hear that uh, ASHRAE, uh, American uh, Society for Heating, Refrigerating, uh, and Air Conditioning Engineers are doing some work with Michigan Department of Quality, or EGLE, um, now, so it's good to see that that partnership has started and that they have linked up with schools. So schools are being given uh, more supports uh, in that area as well, because unfortunately we've been rushing to open the economy. We've tried to open up these school doors without thinking all of these things through. And then, as I said, because of previous legislation, policy, positions, whatever you want to call it, 
we're not prepared uh, for for such a disaster uh, as what we're seeing unfolding in, in before our eyes. But it's not the the public health uh, uh, community that has caused or is inflicting uh, these harms uh, on our children or anyone else. I thank God for public health right now. Thank you, Dr. Pugh. And to your point about uh, historic underfunding, for many years we allocated precisely nothing for school-based mental health in the state of Michigan. It was only in the last few years that we began to allocate penny one uh, through Section 31N funding in our state budget. Uh, that was allocated at $30 million. It sounds like a lot of money, um, but when it gets distributed over 1.5 million public school children and 832 LEAs and 56 ISDs, it's substantially less. Uh, just a note, we just um, announced the awarding of $7 million worth of mental health grants in the state of Michigan. That got a little bit plowed under in the midst of the conversation around the pandemic. Um, and, and certainly the pandemic is, is, um, is the context in which we, we live. But uh, $7 million worth of children's mental health, staff mental health uh, grants will be very helpful to these school districts, particularly the smaller ones uh, that don't have a lot of resources and uh, will benefit enormously from these. Thank you very much. Let's uh, let's move I, on. I um, have a yeah. comment. Yes, please. Yeah, you know, I um, wanted to make it clear that, uh, you know, talking about that it's not just about deaths and that, you know, the CDC recently came out and said that the flu, it, well, wait, let me reread it, exactly what they said in their report. Uh, quote, the risk of complications for healthy children is higher for flu compared to COVID-19. Um, so that's what the CDC said. And as far as just talking about deaths, I mean, I, I think, see, it's unfortunate because politics has entered, obviously, this, the whole discussion because Democrats don't want to be viewed as criticizing the governor and what they're doing. And but I just wish that we're, we've got 1.5 million kids that are, I think, being inflicted with unnecessary trauma. But at any rate, you know, we're not just talking about deaths. I mean, car accidents, unintended falls, they all don't result in death. There's a ton of them. Uh, that that uh, have long-term implications as well. Uh, you know, there's a million visits uh, up, up to physicians uh, for unintended injuries every year in Michigan. Um, we do know, uh, to a comment, that we don't know uh, what it would be like to open up without uh, masks uh, at schools um, in the social distancing. 13 states are doing it right now without masks and and social distancing. Many countries are doing it with their children. Uh, it, the the risk to children is so very small. It's it's less than the flu. Uh, that even the left wing you know fact checkers are all saying agreeing with that. So you know we got to at least acknowledge that and and what we're putting these kids through, the fear that we're putting these kids through. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know I mean it. So, I mean, I, I wish we could just kind of have a real conversation, but then I know it looks like criticizing one, you know, party or the other. Um, it, it, it's just a shame because we're talking about kids and, uh, and we're inflicting this. So the, the last thing I wanted to ask Dr. Uh, Dr. Rice was you, we talked about choices and yet I've brought up a long time ago, education pods and giving choices to parents that, you know, where 10 or 12 kids could come together and you know, every there's the, the parents are fine with it. Uh, the kids can learn online and be assisted uh, by maybe somebody who's helping a, a, an instructor. Um, you know, these things uh, probably for political reasons are not being allowed. It appears, um, and it's a shame. I mean, it, you know, I, I wish we would open up to all choices and not just uh, choices that politically aren't as problematic as other ones. Mm -hmm. But you know, mm -hmm. that we would actually think of the kids. Um, and do it for the kids. Okay, well, I, I, don't I don't know that anybody has cornered the market on caring more about kids in the midst of a pandemic. What are you I'm not education pods and, and options for parents in that area? You said you were going to. What have you done specifically? We, we have met with Laura on the issue of education pods. We've spoken with the governor's office on the issue of education pods. 
it's a complicated issue. It doesn't get resolved right. in one day. So to your earlier point about the concern about unintended falls, I don't know how you set public policy associated with unintended falls. Right. Moreover, the CDC right. is not talking about coronavirus every day because coronavirus is less is less uh, of a concern than is the flu. It's talking about coronavirus every day because it's profoundly troubling. Dr. Pugh? Yeah, I just want to make sure that you know that I, uh, Tom, that um, while politics are, are at play, <laughs> they very well are. Uh, I want you to know that I spent uh, four or five years of getting an engineering degree, chemical engineering degree, and 10, probably 10 or so years uh, getting a public health degree from one of the best universities, I would say top universities in the country, top two. Uh, so for me, this is not about politics. My, my concern about COVID, you can look back. My discussion started before uh, we started having these larger discussions. Uh, I've worked in public health for 14 years. I worked when we didn't have uh, uh, and I, if you want to talk about politics, yes, there. I worked under the H1N1 under a different administration when they took the disease serious. Uh, and so from that aspect, I will say that this has been a utter failure. This is a disaster, a public health disaster. This is not about public health. It's about saving and protecting lives. And to Tiffany's point, and Tiffany, I, I feel for you. I had a cousin who called me late the other night and said, you know, Pam, um, Sonny died. That's my uncle. Uh, he died on March 14th. And I said, yes, we have not, I, I just, I have not owned that because we have not been able to come together as a family. But I don't have to talk about my personal uh, situation. It, it is there. Uh, it lingers, but we can talk about uh, this disease. And, and let me just say this, when my uncle died, it wasn't like a car crash where it might be uh, a, a few people who are impacted. His church was closed down. His wife's church was closed down. I had, uh, uh, his wife was quarantined for 14 days. My aunt, my two cousins, there were two other people who died. There were uh, uh, paramedics uh, that and, and uh, first responders that had to be quarantined and the undertakers and the, the morgue uh, had to be quarantined. This is the most infectious disease that we've seen. The data has been covered up. I screamed about the airborneness of, of exposure of, of this as public health people on the ground or those of us we had to scream for oh, in order to get this message out because the CDC was not able. They had to do this dance between the politics if you want to talk about politics. So getting the information out uh, has been a struggle so people can protect themselves. That's where the politics is. It's politics, my friend, as a CPA, when the dollars are more important than the people, and and I'm sorry. Yeah, that was outrageous, Pam. I, you know, I wish you wouldn't go there. That's that's a shame. Okay. All right. So, um, I think we've. Uh, we've I, don't, I don't think the money is more important than lives. That's outrageous. Okay. I hope you. I'm glad you apologize. there. It's about the kids and teachers. I went there. You should just not. You should. would like to say something. Please. Dr. Rice, would you pay close attention to your chat board here? I actually had a comment put in before Pam started to speak, and I think we need to do our best to stay um, on point and professional in this yes, discussion. Yes, yes, very yes. much agree, and you are the point person here. So, um, gosh, where, where do I start? I just want to say I'm sorry to Tiffany. I'm sorry to Pam. I understand your passion. I very much do. I have family situations myself, but I don't feel it's the appropriate space to share that. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean that I, I can't understand where you're coming from or respect that you've chosen to do so. Uh, I feel extremely, 
extremely passionate and very strong that this space is here um, for us to talk about what we do collectively and collaboratively for 1.5 million children in the state of Michigan. That's, that's what this space is for. We're here during a pandemic after a quarantine dealing with a highly infectious virus and the outcome and the things that have come about. Um, the only comment that I wanted to leave after all of this discussion is considered um, would be, we've talked about data, data, data. Michael, I saw you light up when we were talking about the data of how many teachers we've lost in this discussion and in this entire experience. Please light up about how many kids we've lost in our count and we can get there. You've lit up about the nuance related to that data on every every other level. We talk about the importance of that data. Light up for how many kids have disengaged at this point in time. We have enough data, enough nuance, enough professionalism, enough education on board that we can all have that discussion as we move forward. It's important in understanding the educational gap that is growing. Ms. Vecta. You're on mute. Sorry about that. Um, I, I, you know, I, I think in repeating what you said, Mike, Michael, we all care about the kids and I'm really, you know, so we want to shake our fingers at each other and say something's outrageous, but then imply that the superintendent doesn't care about kids because he lit up. Uh, I, I mean, that's like, I mean, it's, it's the same thing. If you, you're, you're, implying that he doesn't care about kids and I, i'm just i just want us all to just stop we all care about kids we're all coming at from a different angle and you know whether it's in a subtext or direct um comment i just would ask us that we stop thank you thank you Ms. vecto let's move on to the um to the next topic if we could Next agenda item is the monthly presentation on the top 10 strategic education plan, the goal to expand early childhood learning opportunities. Uh, this is a presentation on the top 10 strategic education plan. We are doing one a month. It will include metrics, data, and contributions to support the goal. Following the presentation, we'll engage in further conversation with the board about expanding early learning opportunities for Michigan students. This is an informational presentation does not require board action. Presenters are Ms. Sheila Alice, Chief Deputy Superintendent, Dr. Scott Kennigschneck, Deputy Superintendent of P20 System and Student Transitions, and Mr. Richard Lauer, Director of the Office of Preschool and Out of School Time Learning. There'll be a PowerPoint presentation. Gentle people, good morning, welcome. Thank you, Dr. Rice. Good morning, everyone. Today's Top 10 Strategic Education Plan presentation is the second in a series on the goals and metrics included in the plan. Dr. Scott Kenischek, Mr. Richard Lauer, and I are pleased to have this opportunity to continue this series of presentations to you. The eight goals that you see on this slide are included in Michigan's Strategic Education Plan. During the September State Board of Education meeting, we engaged in our first presentation on metrics and chose the goal increase the percentage of all students who graduate from high school. You may remember that we presented data on the four-year, five-year, and six-year graduation rates. These data sets showed an increase in percentage points from 2015 to 2019 for all students and for most of the groups of students during that four-year time frame. Today's presentation includes some equally positive metrics for another goal in Michigan's Top 10 Strategic Education Plan, and that goal is expand early childhood learning opportunities. Dr. Kenischek will begin by presenting background information on Great Start Readiness, Readiness Programs, or GSRP, to create a context for the data, and then Mr. Richard Lauer will present the metrics data aligned to this goal. The metrics data presented will reflect the years from 2015 to 2019 on the number and percent of children served in GSRP and the number of children eligible for GSRP. The data presented will include all students and two of the groups of students, 
data by gender and data, data by race ethnicity. For two of the groups, students with disabilities and English learners, we do not currently have the ability to break out the data for these two categories, but anticipate a change in at least one of them in the near future. Mr. Lauer will also share the wonderful ratings that Michigan has received from NEAR or the National Institute for <coughs> Early Education, Education Research for our state-funded pre-kindergarten programs and the very positive effect of early childhood education on later student outcomes. Additionally, Dr. Kenishtek and Mr. Lauer will share strategies for expanding early learning opportunities for the youngsters in our state. And now I'd like to welcome Dr. Kenishtek to begin his portion of today's presentation. Great, thank you, Sheila. And so as Sheila has shared before, uh, I turn it over to, uh, to Mr. Lauer to talk about the metrics. We wanna kind of um, provide some context for those metrics. Um, and the first point we want to make is that there are various factors um, that contribute to how GSRP is implemented, um, both at the state and local level. And uh, some of those factors include statute changes um, that uh, in, in one instance reduced actually the number of children that could be enrolled and in, in, in served. Um, there is, are also and have been um, for a number of years different program options and those program options have been driven by parent choice, uh, local infrastructure, the capacity um, to serve children um, in districts. And then finally, uh, another factor um, when we talk about GSRP uh, are funding cuts or funding investments. So if you can move to the next slide, what we did with this slide is just to try to show you one example um, of a change uh, that uh, impacted the system. So along the bottom of the slide, um, are lightning bolts. And those lightning bolts represent um, a either significant statute change, significant program change, or significant funding cut or investment. Now, I'm not going to go through each one of those lightning bolts, but you kind of get the picture that over time, um, various factors arise. Um, the factor we do want to show, though, is the percent of GSRP children served by program option. So if you go to 2006-2007, Nope, sorry, if you can go back to the slide. If you go back to 2006, 2007, um, you can see the orange line starts. And what that orange line is, in, in that year, there was a program change that allowed for children to be served in full day programming. Um, and so that was a program change that affected GSRP. At the same time, if you look at the blue line, those are children who are in part day, the GSRP programs. And so the consequence of that is we had fewer students choosing uh, part day, and our parents probably choosing part day for, for their children uh, and more uh, parents choosing full day. And you can see also then where that intersects. Um, so from a programming point of view, the type of programming offered certainly has an impact on the number of kids served. If you can go to the next slide. And when we look at uh, the number of eligible children served, uh, what we've done here is we've gone back to 2005 um, and averaged the number of children served from 2005 to 2009. And you can see the average there is just a little over uh, 23,000. Uh, we took a look at the same data uh, snapshot for the following five years uh, from 2010 to 2014, uh, a slight increase. Um, you'll see a major increase uh, from 15 to 19. Um, and that is corresponds with a funding increase, a funding investment into GSRP um, by the then Governor Rick Snyder of about $130 million. And so you can see a little bit of a plateau effect um, and uh, without an additional increase uh, or investment in funding, um, it's gonna be unlikely that we're going to see the next step up. And with that, um, I would like to turn it over to, uh, to Mr. Lauer to walk us through some of the metrics that Sheila mentioned previously. Thank you, Dr. K. So I'd like you to um, keep in mind what Dr. K mentioned um, about the considerations as we look through the specific data metric uh, related to the metrics uh, on the next several slides. So when we think about the number of children eligible for GSRP, uh, the numbers for the last several years um, have gone down, as you can see. The most recent 2019 data, uh, 64,148 children eligible for GSRP. We, we get this number uh, for understanding because we purchase it specifically from 
the U.S. Census Bureau. Uh, we started doing that back in 2015. And this is purchased specifically um, in alignment with the statute. So we know how many children at or below 250% of the federal poverty level are qualifying for GSRP. And this is the number that we have here. And so you can see the four year difference um, over time. So there are slight fluctuations. On the next slide. And then we have the number of eligible children served in GSRP as well as the percent. Now this obviously is contingent upon the total allocation that the legislature and the administration come to every year in the state school aid budget. So the total amount of funding for GSRP, which is just over $249 million. Um, so currently in fiscal year 21. So in 2019, you see 37,140 children, 58%. So despite what you saw in terms of a decline uh, in population year to year to year, we relatively stayed stable over those years. Yes, negative 366 actual children um, less, but you see a three percentage uh, point increase over time. So we continue to see, serve a larger percentage of eligible children served despite some of those other considerations that Dr. K pointed out. Next slide. Now, uh, as um, Ms. Ellis mentioned, we were breaking this out by gender and race and ethnicity. What you'll see over these next slides is pretty sta stable um, percentage and numbers over these uh, five years. So the four year difference, you're gonna see zero percentage point difference because the numbers are so small because of the stability. Um, what you will see if you go on to the next slide, this is male, female, and then break out by race and ethnicity, you'll see there's a difference of maybe one percentage point one way or another. If you go on to the next slide and the next slide, Mark, you'll see that the, the areas of influence and the next slide, Mark, are in the areas of African-American, Hispanic, two or more races, and white. And it really has to, it boils down to the data sophistication and the reporting and identification where over from 2015 to 2019, families and the children are identifying as multiracial instead of a discrete um, black, white, Asian, his, his, you know, Hispanic. So in a specific um, discrete identity. So that's where we see some fluctuations here as well as corresponding to slight decline uh, in certain population numbers. So overall, very flat, plus or minus um, 1%. If we move on to the next slide, this is where we move on to how does Michigan's Great Start Readiness Program uh, compare to other states from a national um, standpoint. Um, and a couple weeks ago, we put out a press release um, before the uh, initial um, board meeting was to be held and about how Michigan, again, ranks first um, related to meeting all 10 quality benchmarks as uh, near at Rutgers University measures across the states. Um, and I presented on this a couple times to the state board over the last couple of years. Um, but yes, Michigan's Great Start Readiness Program is one of the more premier state funded preschool programs across the country. As you can see here across the top line, there are 10 quality benchmarks. We meet all 10 um, and between 17 and 18, um, or 16 and 17, the benchmarks were actually uh, adjusted and the rigor of the benchmarks were increased and we still meet 10 out of 10. The national rankings, um, when thinking about uh, where we are, we share uh, this ranking and where it says tied with three other, um, two other. Yes, we share with, just for informational purposes, um, our ranking slots with Mississippi, Alabama, for 2018 and 2019, Rhode Island was um, joining us in that tied 
national rank of first place um, related to not only meeting the 10 national benchmarks. So when thinking about, um, and just for a point of information on the number of states, not all states have, so just be aware of that. So when we are number one in rank and tied with number uh, three other states, there are, that accounts for 45, 44 states plus DC. So that's first of 45. I just wanna make that clear for transparency's sake. Um, so there uh, Idaho, Indiana, New Hampshire, South Dakota, Utah, and Wyoming do not have state preschool. So just for transparency's sake here. Now, NEAR also ranks, besides quality measures, they rank states on access, which is the percent of states four-year-olds uh, that they serve, and they also rank uh, states according to funding level, which is the state's actual um, resource or expenditures per child. So you can see where we are on that. Um, related, related to access, we rank 18. Um, and in the areas of access and funding, it includes all 50 states. Um, because they do account for states that don't have any, so they rank them as a zero. And funding, uh, we're at 14. So all in all, we're doing very well um, on quality. The important thing here from my point of view is that we do not forsake quality when we continue to work on increasing access um, and as we continue to work on equity and adequacy of funding for GSRP as it relates to the overall educational resources. So next slide. Um, so we've built our GSRP program that started in 1985 based on research that began in the 1960s and 70s. Um, the premier programs that really were the foundation of research and evaluation related to early childhood that were high in rigor, high in research um, methodology, Perry Preschool Project out of Ypsilanti, Michigan, which you may have heard of, the Abbasidarian Project, Chicago Child Parent Centers, and the New, Jer New Jersey Abbott program. These are by far the gold standards um, across the early childhood spectrum of research and evaluation um, outcomes programs. They revealed the benefits. Yes, there's a wide variety of re um, dollars that went into them, outcomes. But these were the inspirations for why GSRP was created back in 1985. And of course, we've always improved upon it. And now we have the outcomes we do. One point I'd like to make is that, of course, preschool is not an inoculation. There are grades K through, you know, K through second grade. When we think about the third grade reading law and third grade outcomes and so forth, when we think about early literacy, elementary school makes a difference. The wonderful thing is we in the department, as well as in the field, we both are working together on great opportunities to align pre-K through grade three now in many areas, including early literacy, as well as um, quality curriculum, et cetera. So there's great progress, both within the department, as well as in, in partnership with the field. But the bottom line here is consistently, the research has shown students who attend quality preschool programs, this use quality, uh, are more prepared for school. And as long as we have consistency in the quality, are less likely to be identified as having special needs, uh, need for special needs intervention. Uh, they are less likely to be held back a grade and they're less likely um, to uh, score lower on standardized tests, as well as they're more likely to graduate high school. Now, GSRP, I have two links here for you. Um, the short and long term effect for GSRP, we see these just as much as we see them in these uh, studies of the 1960s and 70s, and we see them in early literacy and math in particular. And we uh, have a longitudinal study from 1995 to 2011 we presented to the board in 2012 that showcased these outcomes for GSRP, but we didn't stand on our laurels, we continue uh, to showcase additional research and, uh, and evaluation on GSRP that the legislature funds in 2018, for example, 
Um, there was a study done again by uh, Rutgers University of eight states around early literacy and math and the sustained impact of the preschool program 12 months out, which means at the end of kindergarten and Michigan had the highest impact of, at, of early literacy. Um, and that's a great thing to showcase um, about the sustained impact of our programming. Next slide. And I'm going to hand off to Dr. K for this one. Great, thank, thank you, Richard. So uh, we'll shift gears here and talk a little bit about our efforts uh, moving forward to expand our early learning, uh, early childhood learning opportunities uh, to support the attainment of the eight goals in the Michigan uh, Top 10 Strategic Education Plan, including this goal of expanding learning opportunities. The department has developed many strategies. The first is to provide an online repository of contributions of best practices. This online repository will provide local districts uh, with a venue to post their best practices or contributions for each goal in the top 10 strategic education plan. Districts will be able to post the best practices that they're using in their district uh, that are having the most positive influence on expanding early childhood uh, opportunities. Additionally, uh, LEAs, local districts, will be able to use this collection of contributions as they work on their own practice to expand early childhood opportunities in their districts. A second strategy is to convene educators uh, to share these best practices. So we'll have a repository, but we also want to create an arena for folks to talk about these and share these. Uh, the department will bring educators together to create a community of learners to share best practices, again, for each of the goals, including this one. Educators will convene to share their best practices, identify the research that supports that particular practice, provide details uh, about the selection process uh, and the implementation strategy used for each best practice. Uh, and also to discuss the positive effects of each practice on student outcomes. The third strategy is to create a series of written documents about the best practices with input from the research uh, and from the local district experience. This strategy will be a logical outgrowth of best, the best practices accumulations and convenings over a period of years. And these documents obviously then will be uh, made available uh, when produced. And finally, the department will offer additional supports to uh, local districts with their efforts to expand early childhood opportunities. Uh, we'll also be able to provide uh, guidance to districts on ideas they may have uh, and will certainly serve as a resource for districts uh, as they expand their early childhood learning opportunities. And I will turn it back uh, over uh, to, uh, I believe, Richard um, to finish. Yes, so based on Michigan's top 10 uh, education strategic plan that you've adopted back in June, uh, the State Board's vision is every learner in Michigan's public schools will have an inspiring, engaging, and caring learning environment that fosters creative and critical thinkers who believe in their ability to positively influence Michigan and the world beyond. This particular goal, I believe, expand by thinking about expanding access and eligibility for GSRP will help move us to achieve this goal. So thinking about contributing uh, additional contributions to expand early learning opportunities, there we, we do it not only in the department, but in partnership with the field in several ways. These three ways here outlined on the, on the screen um, are kind of buckets. Activities increase investment. Not only we have opportunities to propose uh, in, uh, through the budget process on an annual basis, um, request for increased investment to GSRP, but we do it in partnership with our supporters in the field and the local districts, the intermediate school districts, the um, private uh, nonprofit community uh, who are our providers because we have a mixed delivery system for GSRP and over 30% of, um, of our providers are private child care providers across the state and, and they're essential, whether they be faith based, non um, nonprofit, what have you. So activities to increased investment. That's one of the additional um, contributions that we have for expanding. Refining our data sophistication, as Ms. Ailis mentioned earlier, um, we don't have everything broken out from an equity lens yet but we have an ability to work on it and work with our partners at CEPI to do so. And so we're going to continue to do that as well as uh, work with my, uh, CEPI on my school data to be able to present that data in different ways um, through that portal 
uh, for GSRP. And then finally, you know, we, uh, the, as I mentioned earlier, the state legislature administration through the state budget funds ongoing um, research and evaluation of GSRP. Um, and so given that, we have an ability to continue to evaluate and improve the program with dissemination activities and building of knowledge on GSRP's influence. And more important is to be able to showcase the impact of GSRP. And so we have an ability to do this um, and be able to, uh, through those two links I provided on the previous slide, and we're able to be able to um, continue to produce reports for the public and communicate out the importance of where we are, especially given the fact that we score so highly on the quality of our program nationally. With that, I want to turn it over to Ms. Ellis to um, close out our presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Thank you, Dr. Kenishek. This concludes our presentation on metrics for the goal to expand early childhood learning opportunities. And Dr. Rice, I am returning the presentation to you. Thank you very much to our uh, three presenters, Ms. Alice, Dr. Kenishnek, Mr. Lauer, board members, any questions or comments? Dr. Pritchett. As soon as I unmute myself here, yeah, thank you. Um, first of all, thank you for the report. Um, I personally am a strong uh, supporter of GSRP. Uh, I had the uh, uh, privilege of watching it in action when I worked in local school districts and then when I was at the ISD, uh, because the ISDs uh, coordinate those programs. I am pleased to see that it is expanding. I know that its impact is felt um, by many children, thousands of children and families across the state of Michigan. So thank you for that information. I did have one question. Um, is there a grant out there now or a um, program out there that some districts are able to um, offer programming for three-year-olds. I know GSRP is primarily for four-year-olds, um, and so I was wondering about uh, the three-year-olds and whether we're looking to expand or that is just a maybe a one-time grant program. Concise response. <clears throat> Scott. Yeah, Richard, I was going to lean on, lean on you to, uh, to answer that one. Okay, sure. So um, GSRP is exclusively for four-year-old children and uh, under a federal grant, the preschool development grant, birth through five, that is a uh, specific three-year grant. We have an opportunity to pilot test a three-year-old um, model concept. And so we are in the process of um, testing, starting a process to test a, what a three-year-old public pre-K model that was developed under Race to the Top Early Learning Challenge. Um, and that will be for a total of 140 children per year, three-year-olds per year for two years. And so it's, it's really research and development of a three-year-old model and that's it at this point. All right, research, thank you. Re research and development of a three-year-old model based on uh, a federal grant, very, very small, less than 1% of the total four-year-olds in our four-year-old GSRP program state run. Okay, thank you. Other, uh, thank you, Dr. Pritchett. Other uh, questions or comments, Ms. Snyder? Just, I think a question that I've asked before about uh, data surrounding um, not the U.S. Census purchased data point of uh, how many eligible kids there are for GSRP, but rather is there a connect with the data in terms of people who have who want access to GSRP but don't have it? Um, are we serving all people who do want access, not, you know, just trying, kind of taking eligible out of the equation. Do we have that um, information? Mr. Lauer. So related to wait list um, is 
that kind of a proxy for your question, Ms. Snyder, uh, for those who want GSRP but don't have access to it right now. We have waitlist information um, as of last year. We had to ask permission from the legislature to write that into our statute. And so we do collect waitlists um, by ISD for how many children, um, again, uh, and so it's roughly around 2,000 children um, a year for the last two years. Can I follow up right. on that? But be, but, be, but be clear that the wait list does not fully reflect unmet need. The wait Absolutely. list reflects people who have put their names on a list. There are thousands and thousands and thousands of children who need preschool, whose parents uh, recognize the benefit of it, who do not have access to it in the state of Michigan. And that's one of the reasons why, while we were rated number one in the country on quality, we were rated number 18 in access. Mm -hmm. We're falling down in terms of access. We need to do better in terms of access mm -hmm. in the state. Very good. Um, other Mike? board members? Hello, this is Lupe. Hi there, Lupe. Uh, uh, Welcome. Hi. How, how is everyone? Uh, good discussion. Now, uh, I, I have one question. Uh, the report, of course, I'm very, very pro uh, preschool programs, especially for the children that I advocate for, uh, second language uh, um, learners. English, uh, you call them English learners. Okay, now when we talk about the English learners, can you uh, specify, extend who we are talking about? For our data label for English learners, it's uh, any child reported in our data system to CEPI that the family identifies that another language is spoken in the home. Um, so we see that as an asset, uh, not necessarily as a deficit, because at this early age of development, uh, second language in the home um, is viewed as a uh, positive. So uh, English language learners, dual language learners, we we don't uh, label the eligibility uh, factor as such. We label it as second, uh, second or another language spoken in the home other than English. Ms. Ramos Montini, a follow up question? Well, I, I still am not certain what we're talking about, who we're. Uh, <laughs> The, the response uh, complicated my my question. Uh, so so are, are we saying that that then those students that speak English at school and in Spanish at home receive these services or tell me more I tell me more clarify that uh, English learner definition for me the more so english learner is a eligible is is, is a flag um, within the michigan student data system but for eligibility for gsrp the el actual eligibility factor is uh, another language spoken in the home other than english so when we um, do intake for recruitment and enrollment for gsrp um, it is any language spoken in the home other than English um, can be a eligibility factor. Now, GSRP is primarily an income-based program, but we do collect a variety of other eligibility factors um, to document other types of resources, needs of families, of the children, et cetera. But when it comes to language, not only additional possible resources, et cetera, but also to ensure that then the actual uh, in instruction and the environment is culturally responsive 
to the children and celebrated within the classroom. This is part of the quality aspect of GSRP, and it gives an opportunity for the teacher and the family to work together to ensure that there is a homeschool connection that is um, supportive for the child. And because the child may not come into the classroom uh, even speaking English or speaking very little English, and there needs to be some bridging right, right, there. Right. And right, so, right, right. so that is part of the, it's just a, um, an eligibility factor, um, a technical label for CEPI to use with the Michigan School Data System, but from a programmatic practice standpoint, it is an, uh, uh, an informational piece on a practice level to help connect and inform how we can work with the child and work with the families. Of course, in the classroom, unless it is a immersion program, which we have a few around the state for GSRP, okay. but most of the classrooms are English based. But if it's um, if there's a preponderance of a certain language other than English, then it may be a mixed spoken language and will ensure that someone of that spoken language is the assistant teacher in that classroom so there can be an identification for those children as well as helping with that bridging and transition at the especially at the beginning of the year so that over the course of the year it may be a mixed spoken language classroom as you continue to work through the curriculum and by the end of the year as they're getting ready to transition to the public schools or private schools that then they build up their vocabulary uh, in the English language ready for that. Is that helpful? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. That's exactly what I was uh, looking for uh, because I, I did, was a bilingual teacher at one time and exactly what you're describing was our intent at the, that particular time and and it that is the intent that should be uh, used throughout because we want to connect the other language with the English language so the students can continue progressing in school so thank you very much for that explanation thank you seeing no other questions or comments at the time thank you to our presenters we appreciate it We'll move on to our next uh, topic. Next agenda item is an approval of Camp Tuzmahita spending plan for fiscal year 2021. Michigan School for the Blind Trust Fund Committee met on August 26th. Ms. Michelle Fecto and Ms. Nikki Snyder represent the board on the Trust Fund Committee. They reviewed the Camp Tuzmahita spending plan for fiscal year 2021. Board is being asked to approve the spending plan during today's meeting. Ms. Fecto and Ms. Snyder, do you have anything initially to say uh, before we begin our presentation? Um, I just wanted to give um, a shout out to the camp director, Jill um, to Garden, my thing. Um, it's been a real challenging um, year given the COVID and trying to work with, you know, the populations visually impaired and doing it from a distance. and. In our meeting, she reviewed um, some really incredible, engaging activities, really creative to keep people engaged. And I was just very impressed with her work and um, you know the work of the of, of Camp T and all the people affiliated with it. So um, I just wanted to make sure to give a shout out to you, Joe. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Becca. But there are many other people there. I just um, that are also doing doing great work as well, um, Roxanne. And um, so anyway, so I uh, that's my uh, two cents for now. <laughs> Thank you. Our sure. presenters uh, today are Dr. Scott Kenichnecht, Ms. Roxanne Balfour, Director of Low Incidence Outreach in the Office of Special Education, Ms. Jill Teagarden, Director of Camp T, and Ms. Michelle Wolf financial manager for low instance uh, outreach. And if we if we could begin with a, uh, a motion and a second, and then uh, the presentation. Do I have a motion? So moved. Do I have a second, second. and a support? Second, very, very good. Um, and now let's do the presentation as, as the discussion and the vote thereafter. Gentle people. Thank you, Dr. Rice. I, I do want to uh, to reiterate Michelle's comments. Camp T really is a hidden gem 
it's a tremendous asset um, to the visual impaired community um, in Michigan. And I'm fortunate to be joined by Roxanne, Jill, and Michelle um, to go over that spending plan. And I'm gonna turn that over to Roxanne to, uh, to begin. Hi, right, thank you. Um, State, I'm Roxanne Balfour, the director of MDELIO, and today with me is Jill, who is, at, many of you may remember Jill and Michelle were at last year's State Board of Ed meeting. It was their very first meeting, and this has been their first full year, so kudos to both of them. They've stepped up, and they've just gone steps beyond where I would have expected them to be with all the work they've done, so I appreciate all their work. I also want to thank uh, our trustees, Nikki and Michelle, for all the support they've given. Michelle, we're going to miss you next year. Um, you've come out to camp. You've seen what it's about. Um, you've been involved. So thank you for all the time you've given us. We'll miss you. My pleasure. Uh, we're here today to have you approve actually our spending plan um, for our, this coming year. But we like to talk a little bit about how we used the money the previous year so you know uh, what we're about and what we've done and how we think things through before we make decisions. For those of you who aren't familiar, Camp T, as we call it, is a 300-acre camp. It was designed for students who are blind, visually impaired in Greenville, Michigan in 1974. We've expanded to include other people to come to the camp that have an education focus for youth. Um, so we get a lot of different groups and the report that all of you received, you'll see some of that information in it. We're gonna have Michelle pull up the report in a minute. Um, but I first want to tell you a little bit about what happened last year. When we talked to the board last year, we mentioned, well, we're going to be doing an activity center and we're going to be doing an entryway and we're going to do phases. It was mentioned to us from the Office of Finance that, you know, you may want to think if you really want to get this project underway, uh, you may be able to get an increase with the state budget office if you want us to try and work with you on that. And we said that would be great. You know, so the activity center that we had talked to all of you about last year was to support activities, physical education for students that come and use the facilities. We have a Paralympic U.S. men's team um, in Michigan. Uh, the U.S. team won the gold ball in 2016, received a silver medal. So we've got a consultant who's actually part of that Paralympic working with us to make sure that we're making all the right color choices, textures, everything we need to serve um, our community. And so that's been a great working relationship. But as we went along with the state budget office, um, we kind of felt everything just stopped with COVID. We didn't have approval, builders had to quit. Um, but then all of a sudden, things start picking up again and there was a little bit, okay, this is how we can proceed and given some direction. And lo and behold, at the end of May, the state budget office approved the authority to spend what we needed for our activity center. We still had to get some hurdles done through DTMB because we had these contractors and we hadn't been doing any work and we had to have it all done by August and we didn't think that was going to happen. Well, again, lo and behold, it happened. And so we met with the trustees to let them know that we had an increase, that we were able to get this underway and completed. Um, we could go ahead and encumber the funds. Our completion date is in April or May. So I am hoping to put out an invite to all of you for a ribbon cutting ceremony um, with that. And we hope to have some of our Paralympic goalball team members join us as well. So look forward to that next year. Uh, right now, Michelle can pull up a report that all of you should have received um, in the mail. So you can see the colorful pictures and some of the activities. And to just talk a little bit more about Michelle was uh, mentioning earlier in our trustee, we wanted to go a little bit over this briefly because we know you have a full agenda. So we're going to let you look at some of this information on your own because we've got Jill here to talk about the activities uh, pre and post is what I'm going to call it COVID. We also have some data in there and obviously the numbers are going to reflect where we're at with COVID, but we are gearing up in such a way that when we can come back in person, wow, it's going to be a dynamic place. We're going to be marketing it, getting our kids there. Um, so we're very, very excited about while we're down, what we're doing to make it a productive place. So Jill, I'm going to turn it over to you if you can go ahead and take some time and talk about some of these creative activities you've done. And again, you'll see some data that you can just leisurely look on your own for this. Thank you. All right, thanks Roxanne. My name is Jill Teagarden. I am the camp director at Camp T. And I'm, I'm gonna kind of walk you through some things of what we've been able to do the past year. Back in October of 2019, which is about a year ago, we were kind of normal. Everything was pretty normal at camp. And we were able to hold our family nature club pumpkin palooza at camp. And we had campers out 
to carve pumpkins, baking pies, we made crafts, we took hikes, we were in full swing. In November, December, we were shut down for a couple months because we had new shingles and new flooring going into white pine, but we were back and running again in January where we had independent living skills training for teachers that came to camp to learn how to guide students through some independent living skills that piggybacked with our Family Nature Club Winter Adventure Program and participants were able to go snowshoeing. We were cross country skiing. They even painted their mom's fingernails. They learned how to shave. They even baked some lasagna. And in February, we piggybacked with um, the National Federation of the Blind and did a birding by ear program, even though it was extremely cold that weekend participants were able to uh, we made some bird houses we played some bird bingo and there were some pretty intense uno games going on that weekend and in march everything kind of came to a halt just like everything else in the world we had to cancel programs and kind of rethink how we we're going to connect with families and students so after doing some brainstorming, coming up with a few ideas, we concentrated on three particular programs, discovery kits, adventure packs, and virtual campfires. And with the discovery kits, we wanted, the goal of that program was to get students, or give students a camping experience even though they were at home. So I had to try to think through what we were doing as far as programming with that. and. We wanted to make sure that they were still having fun, that they still learned something and that they were able to enjoy nature in some form or fashion. So there were three specific kits designed, each uh, based on different grade levels or ages, I guess we could say. Michelle, if you go to the next slide there, we had the first kit was um, Nature's Way. And that particular kit focused on the students using their senses to explore the natural world. And you can see some of the pictures here that we sent home some items for kids. They received feely bags, scent containers, story sticks, sensory rings. They even made some turkey calls um, and learned a little bit about how animals communicate via sound, all ways to engage their senses outside. And then the next kit that we sent out was ages nine through 12. And that was called the Ama Amazing Adaptations. You can see by some of the pictures that we have here, the students were able to uh, build their own creatures and learn about how they adapted. They had to explain to their family members how their, their animals adapted to their environment. We had kids learning about snakes and how they shed their skin and were actually able to become snakes and shed their skin at home, they learned about frogs and how they have, why they have sticky tongues with a couple different activities. You can see that those pictures there that kind of depict some of the, the activities they were able to engage in. The last uh, discovery kit that we had was called Soil Science. That was geared towards kids ages 13 to 18. And the, just like it was, it was a soil science education pack. So they were able to learn about soil, different soil horizons by using fun foods like cookies and pudding and they learned about soil texture and permeability, all doing experiments well at home. And some of the responses that we got from parents with uh, the survey, we always send a survey out after all these activities and just a, a couple of responses that families had. One parent said, my child enjoyed receiving a package in the mail. The contents had hit all five senses, easy to use, great creative fun, lots of laughs and adventure, a fun way to learn. Another parent said, my daughter has pulled out the mul these items multiple times to do activities. She completed them with me, her sister, and her dad. And my favorite quote from one of the parents said, he kind of groaned about doing something educational, but after one exercise, he was totally hooked. So just but from the response we had from parents, the kids really enjoyed engaging in these particular activities. The second uh, theme I guess we had were called adventure packs. And the goal of this was to bring in a reading component, component in because we have an IMC that produces all these wonderful braille and large print books. And I wanted to have an opportunity to use their 
their skills, I guess you could say, as a part of these programs. So campers received the book that was in the format that they needed, whether it was a braille, large print, or regular print. And then parents also received a re regular print copy to read along with their with their students. And then each of those kits had a particular or three particular activities that went along with it. So the first book that we focused on was for the younger group, ages five to eight, and that was the Monarch Butterfly. And that gave students the opportunity to learn about the life cycle butterfly, to build butterfly with all the parts, and they also planted their own butterfly garden. And the next book that was geared towards students ages nine through 12 was called Summer According to Humphrey. And that was about this hamster. There's a whole series of with this with this uh, hamster and this particular one. He goes to camp with some of the kids from his school. And the focus of this was just to give campers a summer camp experience. So while reading the book, they learned about scavenger hunts comedy nights and owl, owls. So they were able to dissect owl pellets at home. They had comedy nights of their own with their family and then engaged in various scavenger hunts. And then the wild robot activity or book that we had was geared towards the older group. And they had a, more of a science focus with it, the activities that they participated in. And they were they learned about buoyancy by creating boats. They actually built their own wild robot using small um, engines and uh, batteries. So there we'll do some hands-on learning with that. And then the third component we had with these virtual items, I guess you could say, were, were virtual campfires. And the goal of this was really just to, to have fun. We wanted to be able to reach out to our, our community and allow them to, to come together during this difficult time of being separated. And these, act, these uh, campfires included music, songs. We did games like Would You Rather, Name Six. The popular thing we did for each one was it were a scavenger hunt where we had kids running around houses trying to, to dress each other for their favorite vacation or find specific items around the house. So those are really engaging. And one of the quotes we had from one of the family members with, with uh, the virtual campfire was, uh, one of the parents said this, um, it's amazing meeting new families. The leaders are enthusiastic as well as adaptive and innovative. We had such so much fun. It was a perfect event to enjoy during a difficult time. And I saw that quotes like that, or I guess feedback like that, resonate from all those campfires. People were just happy to be together in a comp for a common cause and just to have fun and engage with each other. So when we think about moving forward, I guess with this 2020, we, we're, we're still continuing programming. We're just thinking of it in a little bit different way. We have a couple of family nature clubs planned for October, November, December, and then probably into <clears throat> the beginning of the year. And each of those has opportunity for families to do cooking, STEM activities, outdoor activities, some sort of craft. And we have, a, I actually have a follow-up meeting with families on Saturday. So we'll, I'll be able to get some feedback to be able to plan for some future, future events with November and December to see how that goes with the meetup. And we're also trying to work on coming up with some concepts in order to have families utilize the camp once things are are safe and once we're allowed to open back up we're still trying to we're, we're not still but we continue to work on with a, a game plan in order for families to be able to come out to camp whenever we can make that happen so it's a lot happening at camp even though we're not open but um it's a part of a part of who we are and what we do as far as engaging our learners and campers so i with that i'm just going to turn it over back over to roxanne all right, thanks, Jill. So some of you may or may not know, but Jill came to us as a teacher with a science endorsement. So she brings that component to us. It's amazing, um, as you can see from the activities, uh, how creative she's been with that. And keeping mindful of Dr. Rice's message as far as not everyone has access to 
a computer, an iPad. So that's why we just she worked on these distance learning type activities as well as the virtual to have a balance there for that as well. So thank you, Jill. Um, now we're going to have uh, Michelle Wolf talk uh, briefly about just our facility updates and show you the budget that we've got for this year. So thank you again, Michelle. Thanks, Roxanne. So some of the things that we did this past year as well as the upcoming year are all listed in the report that you have a copy of. I'm just going to highlight a few of those. This past year, we focused a lot on our White Pine facility. As Jill mentioned, in November and December, while camp was closed, we worked on finishing up the new flooring as well as roofing for that building. Um, our salad bar and ice machine were no longer functioning, so we were able to order and replace that equipment this year. Um, continuing just the general upkeep of the campgrounds and trails. We also updated the Wi-Fi system, so we have new internet and Wi-Fi availability at camp, which worked nicely for the virtual programming that we ended up doing this year. We also have quite a bit of tree removal, so over the weekend in late August, a storm went through camp and caused pretty significant damage with uprooted trees and downed power lines. Fortunately, no one was on site at the time, so no one was injured, and amazingly, the trees avoided any of the buildings, so it was really just the campgrounds that needed to be cleaned up. So we're working with a tree service removal company to get that work done. It's still in process. Looking ahead for this upcoming year, as Roxanne mentioned, we'll be continuing work on the new activity center as well as entryway for the camp. We also hope to do some renovations to Elm Hall, which is a building located across from where the new activity center will go to incorporate a nature center as well as a museum to display archives from the uh, School for the Blind. Um, in addition to those, we are looking at replacing our wells. The wells are original to the camp from the 1970s and are due to be replaced. So doing that work as well as, um, as I mentioned, the continuing to do the tree removal from the storm damage. So I'm going to switch over to our spending plan for fiscal year 21. That's on the screen here. You also have a copy of um, the camp director payroll and benefits. I just want to mention that this is a portion of the amount that we have in place for that LIO through our revenue. We pick up the, the rest of that uh, line item to allow more funding for camp to be put towards things for students and campers. Um, our food service contract here, we've continued to work with Greenville Public Schools. While we're not open and using them, we wanted to make sure that was in place so that we could utilize that service when camp is up and running again. Um, I'm going to scroll down to the second page here to talk about our renovation and repair line. So quite a bit of our funding is allocated for this to um, cover work that will be done for the Nature Center as well as the museum that we plan to do. So with that, I will wrap up and then if there are any questions or comments. Thank you very much. Um, questions or comments from board members? I, I believe Nikki had a comment, I think, in the chair, a question in the chat. OK, uh, Ms. Snyder. Thank you, Scott. Um, I wanted to say that um, it's really awesome to see what you guys did in place of um, the virtual and the, um, the external things with the packets, the adventure packets. That was very neat. I'm curious, do you guys need any help with continuing those packets through the next year? I mean, was that a lot of work to put that together? Um, do you have enough helping hands to do that? Is that also built into the budget that you just showed us? Um, is there any further need for help? This is Roxanne. Thank you, Nikki, for asking. We're very, being very cognizant of our social distancing. So though we would love all hands on deck, uh, we've been very uh, careful to have only a few people in a building at a time. So Jill will do some of the work, send it over to our office for the Braille, and then have a consultant come in and do another piece. So though it's appreciated. And when we're all back in person, you can guarantee we'll be asking for some other help with different things. But thank you for checking with us. That's very thoughtful. Thank you. Other, um, other questions or comments of board members? Seeing none, we have a motion uh, on the table. Um, and uh, if we could please um, 
Uh, Marilyn, a roll call vote, please. Um, yes, and in keeping with policy, um, there are no people from the public that wanted to offer a comment on this before the vote. Uh, Fecto. Yes. McMillan. Yes. Pritchett. Yes. Pew. Yes. Ramos Montini. Yes. Snyder. Yes. Tilly. 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 Okay. Albridge. Yes. Motion carries. Okay, very good. It is 1202. We are going to uh, adjourn for lunch. We will be back at uh, 1 p.m. to recommence. Have a good lunch, everyone. Thank you.